profit line, saying that you profit sign. Half the time, you're only talking about some dollar sign. A cloud of glory in the fog machine, two different things. Stuck on tradition, you don't see God use new different things. Hey, you're amazing, grace back then, today don't sound like ours. We put some 808 with Jesus on these kingdom bars. The message the same, though the myth in my chain. Put respect on his name, no disrespect in his name. It's crazy we got demons in the church, and they can't even see him in the church. Singing in the church, man, they leading in the church. Even having meetings in the church. Hey, it's time to pray. Let's fast a month to skip a mill or two. So you'll be ready for whatever God prepares for you. And I don't want to be the lukewarm that he spits out. Find out in the end, that's why I missed out, kicked out. And I don't need no nicotine to calm my nerves. You ever heard of God, the word of God, I trust his word. Everything around you will crumble one day and burn up. Only thing that remains is a kingdom, though that's eternal. Yeah, it's hard to fly with your wings clipped. You better go get your wings fixed. Man, I speak this because I mean this. You can't distinguish my allegiance. That's for Jesus. Praise the Lord, saints. Hallelujah. If you're wondering why you see me, it's pretty much process of elimination. Uh, we weren't able to conduct services in-house. Nevertheless, I felt obligated to bring you a special word on this special day, despite what people say. Amen. I'd like to go right into the verse of the day. It's going to be from the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 6. And the scriptures as follows. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. I'd like to thank Faith Refuge Church Ministries. You can find them on Facebook. I'd like to thank them for this message. It was documented on December 3rd, 2022. If you're a big fan of Kung Fu Flicks, you're really going to enjoy this one. Video is a little bit grainy. Audio is a little bit off. Nevertheless, the word was on point. Amen. Uh, the message was brought forth by Bishop Reginald Davis out of North Carolina. A wise man was said, the door is shut, but the church never closed. Can I get an amen? Amen. Thank you. I ask that you stand to your feet as we welcome into our homes. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord. We take this moment to acknowledge you, our life, our strength, our savior, our healer, our provider, our way maker. Lord, you're everything to us. And before we say another word, we just say thank you. Thank you, Jesus. You didn't have to do anything for us, but you've done everything for us. And our hearts are overwhelmed with gratitude. Lord, I want you to speak to us right now. We need to hear from you. We need to hear from you, Jesus. We didn't come to talk about ourselves, but we came to share what you have laid upon our hearts. So open your mouth and talk to us. Give us ears to hear, to receive, and not only receive, but embrace, and to act upon what you say. Bless every heart in this place. Touch us today. Deliver every heart in mind. Strengthen us. Encourage our hearts, God. And we give your name the glory, the honor, and the praise. In Jesus' name. Come on and give God praise, everybody, right now. Come on. Remain standing with me for the reading of the word, and you'll find us in the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter number two, Nehemiah chapter number two, and I want to read through verse, from verses 10 through 18, in Jesus' name, and I'm not going to be with you long, just want to drop this word, and then we're going to do what the Lord told us to do. Nehemiah chapter 2 and verses 10 through 18. Then Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, heard of it, and it grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. So I came to Jerusalem, and there was there three days, and I arose in the night, and I and some few men with me. Neither told I any man what God, my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Neither was there any beast with me, save the beast that I rode upon. 
And I went out by night by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well and the dung port, yes, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and the gates thereof were consumed with fire. Mm. Then I went on to the gate of the fountain and the king's pool, and there was no place for the beast that was under me to pass. So I went up in the night by the brook and viewed the wall and turned back and entered by the gate of the valley and so returned. And the rulers knew not whither I went or what I did, neither had I as yet told it to the Jews, nor to the priests, nor to the nobles, nor to the rulers, nor to the rest that did the work. Then said I unto them, ye see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come, let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was, upon, which was good upon me, and also the king's words that were spoken unto me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. You can be seated. I want to use for a thought for a few moments tonight a Nehemiah moment, a Nehemiah moment. Just look at the person beside you and tell them, let us rise up and build. build. Told you I'm an honorary Pennsylvanian. Um, I remember as a boy, the late apostle H.D. Jones. I remember his work and his leadership. And the first time I came to Pennsylvania to preach, it was at Refuge Temple in Pittsburgh. And so I remember Bishop Stokes and Mother Stokes and the work there. Then when I came back, I went to Lighthouse for Pastor Long in the diocese. Um, Apostle Kramer is one of my heroes. His kindness, his leadership, um, and just the generous spirit of the man. So this region is not in want of legacy. There is legacy to share. Legacy that should challenge us to always reach for greater because our leaders taught us that. That they taught us faith. They taught us integrity. They taught us righteousness. They taught us about putting the work of God first and doing the work of God above all else. And so we stand on the shoulders of anointed men and women who sacrificed, who labored and shared and gave and poured and poured and poured. And it it, it probably wasn't until now that we understand the things they were trying to teach us. Because sometimes you don't understand the lessons until the teachers are removed. We didn't know how much we needed to pray until the people that were praying for us are no longer with us. We didn't know how much we needed to study until the people that fed us constantly and fed us sometimes when we didn't want to be fed. Come on, somebody. Y'all remember looking at your watch at 2 o'clock and saying, how long he going to preach today? Because it just seemed like he just wouldn't quit. But he knew the day was coming when his, his voice would be silenced. And so he wanted you to have that word. Mothers that would take you aside and sit down and talk to you and encourage you and share life with you and share information with you. And you thought they were wasting your time. And now you wish to God they were still here so that they could pour yet again. But they have already poured into us. And and I came to say this, that we know enough to do this work. Come on here, somebody. We know we know enough right now to do this work because we were blessed with tremendous tutors. And the assignment that the Lord has put in front of us is the assignment of restoration. And restoration doesn't imply that anybody messed up or anybody failed. But anybody know about wear and tear? Just the wear and tear of life and ministry. You don't have to backslide to be restored. You don't have to go back into sin to need to be restored. If you live long enough and fight enough demons, you will find your way back to the altar saying, Lord, restore me. 
that, that's why David said, he restoreth my soul. Hey, shut up. I don't have to ask him. He just knows I need it. And he restoreth my soul. He knows what I've been through. He knows the depletion. He knows the struggle. He knows the burden. And every now and then, God will just show up on his own and start restoring. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You didn't come to church looking for it, but God just showed up to restore because he restores. But there's a fundamental difference. The late apostle, chief apostle Floyd Nelson said this in my church, and I've never forgotten it. There's a difference between restoration and renovation. And there are too many people trying to renovate the church. Because when you renovate, you take something existing and you add your own design to it. Add your own twist to it. You add your own dimension so that it no longer reflects the original vision of the architect, but it now reflects your thoughts about stuff. And we are living in a culture where everybody's trying to renovate the church. We don't need this anymore. We don't need that anymore. This is no longer relevant to our times. It's passe, and so we need to make the church more relevant. And I'm not fighting relevance because we have to speak to people's issues. But when you start throwing out principle, come on somebody. When you start throwing out Bible, when you start throwing out what the scripture says, you have moved from restoration to renovation. And why would a perfect design need renovation? When Jesus Christ himself said, upon this rock, I will build my church. Oh, hallelujah. He's not looking for your little puny plans. He's not looking for your little update design. He says, I need us to go back to the original plans. Because when you renovate... You go back and pull out the blueprints. You go to the mothballs. You go to the filing cabinet. How is this supposed to be structured? And, and, and if I can be so bold, in so many respects, we have deviated from the original designs. And you can't get Pentecostal results being anything other than Pentecostal. Come on here, somebody. You can't get apostolic results being anything other than apostolic. You can't mix us with all of these other isms and schisms and expect the anointing and the power of God to be upon us. There's a reason why on Sunday night some folk left their church and came to your church because there was a power in our church that they didn't have because we knew the source. We knew the source of the power. God is calling on all of us to be restorers of the ministry. What happened in Nehemiah was literally the result of Israel's refusal to accept who they were. Isn't it strange that for hundreds of years they battled with being the country that had a God that nobody could see. Jesus. That was the main issue. Every other nation had a statue, an idol, something they could put up on a shelf to say, this is our God. And when they asked the children of Israel, well, what does your God look like? We don't know. He said, don't have anybody beside him. But then he said, don't make any image of me. There's no pictures of God. I told the folks in morning prayer, God doesn't have baby pictures. Come on here, somebody. Ain't no pictures of when God grew up. From everlasting to everlasting. Glory, thou art God. And no designer, no human can design an idol or a portrait or a picture to encapsulate a God that is spirit. He's not bound by corporeal substance. You, 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 can't make, you can't put him in a box. The best we can come to know God is through Jesus Christ who is the physical representation of God. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and we are what? Complete in him. And if you want anything other than Jesus, you don't really want God. Because he said, he that seeth me seeth the Father. But Israel always struggled with a God. You know, I don't have to see a God that can open up waters. 
I really don't have to see a God that can send manna from heaven. I don't have to see a God that can get, bring water out of rocks. He's doing all that. He can, he can stay in any shadow he want to stay in. Just keep being God to me. Just keep being. And Israel struggled with that. And so they kept adapting to the people that were around them. And that's one of the main problems of the church is that we keep trying to adapt to the people around us rather than to call them out of their sin into godliness. Rather than to call them out of their lack of knowledge of God to a place of really knowing who God is. So what was the results? Invasion, destruction, occupation. City of Jerusalem that was second to none. That was an immense work of God, Jesus. totally torn down. Now, that's a lesson in that, that before God will let us mess up his name, he'll tear down the city. So you can do things in the name of God, but if you don't do them like God wants you to do, before God will let you mess up his name, he'll tear it all down. That's why we've seen the destruction of churches, destruction of ministries, destruction of institutions, because unless God is being glorified the way he wants to be glorified, he's not interested. We think if we just sing a couple of songs and just holler the right way and cry some tears, God will show up. But the Bible says, who shall stand in the holy place? You got to have clean hands and a pure heart. So there's expectations. Walls are torn down. Temple is destroyed. And it laid it waste for 70 years. 70 years. But just because, who I hear you, Holy Ghost. Something is dormant doesn't mean it's dead. Look at somebody tell them, dormant ain't dead. Come on, somebody. Dormant is just waiting on the spirit to blow on it. Waiting on the anointing to breathe on it. And, and for 70 years they waited and God started moving on the hearts of reformers. And I, I don't have time to talk about Haggai and Ezra, but we're talking about Nehemiah. Nehemiah was an official in Babylon. He, he was the king's cupbearer. He was privy to the king. And even though he was not perhaps a great official, he was close enough to the king to talk to the king. And, and he came in one time and it was always important that when you work for the king, you had a good disposition. You had to be sunny and smiley. You couldn't have a down look. You couldn't have a bad hair day because you worked in the presence of the king. And so he looked, the king looked at Nehemiah and said, Nehemiah, why do you look so down? He said, how can I feel good when my homeland is at waste? And God give us that spirit back in the church that we care as much about the kingdom as we do about our own possessions. If your house is not right, there's no peace. If your car is not right, there's no peace. If you got a tick in your car, you will go till you find a mechanic that can tell you what that tick means. But we will walk in and out of the church and let the church die and seem to be completely unconcerned about the nature of the church. Don't you know all of us are going to stand before God to give an account for what we've done with the church in this generation I can't account for Apostle Jones I can't account for Bishop Stokes I can't account for Apostle Kramer but Reginald Davis has to stand before God and give an account for what did you do for the church in your generation what did you do what did you do Nehemiah couldn't feel comfortable and so he shared with the king, all I want to go do is go home and rebuild the walls. Because walls establish boundaries. Walls gives you clearance relative to who can get in and what can get out. And the walls of Jerusalem were torn down. And Nehemiah just didn't feel good about it. You know, there's some stuff that happens in church that I just don't feel good about. There's some stuff that I see that I just don't feel good about. I'm tired. I'm, I'm going to say this and I'm not going to fuss tonight, but I'm tired of people using the pulpit as their stage. 
I'm so vexed by the performance and the acting and the theatrics that does not bring the glory. Hey, Shatana Rabosa. I'm tired of it because the pulpit was never designed to be your stage. It was an altar. So if you don't come to sacrifice, you need to stay off the rostrum, stay out of the pulpit, stay from in front of the people because the only reason why we come here is to present ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable before God. Somebody throw your hands up and say, Lord, I'm here to sacrifice. Oh, God. So, <coughs> the king empowers Nehemiah to go home. And Nehemiah goes home, and he does some things that are strategic. You know, one of the problems that we have, and I'm one of them, is that we talk too much and too soon. Because everybody doesn't need to know the master plan. Can I tell you that there are vision killers? Oh, God. Vision assassins. People that their only purpose is to destroy whatever God plants in your heart. That's why when Sambalot and Tobias heard about it, they got vexed. Trust me, everybody ain't happy about the Allegheny Diocese. Everybody ain't happy for Bishop Designate Alde. Everybody ain't happy for what God is trying to do because there are vision killers that are out there to do anything to destroy what God is trying to do. But I came to remind all of us tonight that no weapon that is formed against us shall be able to prosper. They ain't got to like it, but God's going to bless us anyhow. They ain't got to get with it, but God's going to favor us anyhow. They ain't got to support it, but if God puts his hand on it, it's got to come to pass. Everybody lift your hand and say, it's coming to pass. It's coming to pass. So, he comes in at night and does an assessment of Jerusalem. He sees the burned out portions, the torn down portions, quietly surveying the work. And there's somebody here that God has been quietly speaking to you about what you need to do about the work. See, it's not up to the leadership to do all the praying. You ought to be praying, Lord, what's my piece of this? What's my part of this? What have you assigned to my hands? So Nehemiah spends the whole night looking and surveying. Nobody knows what he's doing. And, and, and so he finally brings together the elders and the leadership. And I'm almost done. And he says, first of all, I need you to know the fix we're in. And one of the worst things the church can do is live in denial. Come on, somebody. One of the worst things we can do is ignore problems. One of the worst things we can do is ignore the needs that exist right in our face. If there's a problem, it's a problem. Come on, somebody. If it's a mess, it's a mess. If it's confusion, it's confusion. Stop trying to put labels on it and just say what it is. If it's a demon, it's a demon. Come on, somebody. Oh, God, just stop, stop saying, oh, we just having a personality conflict. The Bible says that God is not the author of confusion. So if there is confusion, the enemy must be writing the book and we must be reading the book because God is not the author. Arthur, own it for what it is. Oh, God, it's hard to say it, but it's true. We've got churches dying around us. We've got churches that have died around us. And the Bible didn't say ignore the dying. Lord told John in Revelation, tell the saints to strengthen that that is ready to die. Oh, God, some folk on the edge, but I believe we can pray them back into power. Anybody believe that? 
Some folk are discouraged, but I believe we can pray hard enough that God will reunite and reunite and God will revive us. I still believe that if we get on our face, if my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, God said I'll hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sin. I'll heal the land. Anybody still believe in prayer? Anybody still believe in prayer? Anybody still believe in prayer? Come on, lay your hand on somebody and say, in the name of Jesus, the Lord strengthen you right now. In the name of Jesus. I know you didn't backslide, but you've been going through hell and high water, and God's going to strengthen you. He shot God's going to anoint you. God's going to refresh you. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh. Hey, Shatam. Fall fresh. Oh, God. Send a fresh anointing. Gave the assessment. But then Nehemiah said something that was powerful. He says, the Lord's hand has been good upon me. And even in what some might perceive to be a season of drought, the hand of God is still on us. Anybody feel that hand? The hand of God is still on us. We've come through three of the most difficult years I've known in my life. But every day I got up with Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. He took me through storms. When, and I'll be honest, I lost sleep for the first few months of the pandemic because I just didn't know what was going to happen to the church because I understand the fickleness of some church people that when they can't get in a room they think the church has died oh God but some of us learned didn't know how to use our phones but learn how to get on a zoom come on somebody just to be connected with somebody else learn how to use that phone and that text oh God to encourage one another and God kept us together Oh God, we've been to the cemetery so many times, but God kept reminding us that he's the resurrection and the life. And he that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. He reminded us that if you can't get to the building, I'll come to your house. Oh, hallelujah. If you can't get to the church, I'll lay my hand on you in the living room, in the bedroom, in the kitchen. Some of us learn how to dance in our slippers because God was with us even in the house. So I came to tell everybody, pandemic or not, the Lord has been good. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord for he is good for his mercy endureth forever. Everybody in this room that knows the Lord's been good to you, just don't sit there. Give him a praise that he deserves. He kept you through sickness. He kept you in pain. He kept you in grief. He kept you in solitude. But his hand was on you and it's time for you to open your mouth and give God the glory. Make the devil a liar. If the Lord hadn't been with you, you would have died. But he's been good. Anybody here know that he's been good? Open your mouth. Give him the glory. Open your mouth. Open your mouth. Give him the glory. Come on, testify to a neighbor. Say, you don't know my whole story. I've been through so much, but I got to tell you that the Lord's been good to me, and I owe God a praise. He's been good to me, and I owe God a praise. Y'all ain't hearing me. He's been good to me, and I owe God a praise. Open up your mouth. Open up your mouth. Why did you live when other people died? Why did you live when other people went to the cemetery? 
because God has preserved you for this moment. God has preserved you for this moment. I have not seen, I have not heard, neither has it entered his hand was good upon me. His hand his hand was good upon me. Some of us had COVID but the Lord kept you because his hand was good upon you. Nobody was in your church for weeks. But it didn't close because his hand was good upon you. When the governor in North Carolina told us to shut down, we had to go to nine people on Sunday morning. Not bragging, but most Sundays we had over 200 sitting in worship. And then the very next week I said, y'all can't come. Only the praise team, a couple of the deacons. Ministers, and we're going to just have service and stream it online. Did that for about two months. And on Mother's Day, we went outside to the parking lot. Everybody drive your cars. I'm preaching outside in the parking lot. Folk honking their horns instead of saying hallelujah. But don't you know the first Sunday we went to the parking lot, this man drove by looking for a church. Come on, somebody. And said, that sounds like my kind of preaching. Elder and Mother Mary has been with us ever since. And they came through the parking lot. Folks walked out from the park saying, pray for me. We kept baptizing people in the name of Jesus. I would finish or not doing a Bible class. And my phone would ring saying, Bishop, I got to get baptized. And I got to get the Holy Ghost. Because God, the door shut. But the church never closed. Church never closed. Church never closed. Why? Because the hand of God was good upon us. Everybody say that. The hand of God was good upon us. So we see the need and we know we still have the presence of God. So what's our next response? Let us rise up and build. Saints, it's time to get up. We, we were stalled for a minute, but it's time to get up. Rise up out of what happened yesterday. Rise above who doesn't like us. Rise above who's trying to stop us. Rise above who's talking about us. Rise above the folk that defected because everybody lost somebody. Rise above who doesn't want to come to church anymore. Rise above who got busy. Bishop, pastor, rise above who got bitter. Step out of it and put your eyes on what God is planning to do. Because I came to declare to everybody that God's about to move in the body of Christ. Anybody believe it? I don't care how many years you've had when you felt like what you were doing was a waste of time. It's a new season and this is the day that the Lord has made and I will rejoice and be glad in it. I need somebody that has the faith to get up. Get up out of your failure. Get up out of your lack of success. Get up out of your de denigration. Get up out of your struggle and make the step that if the Lord helps me I'm going to build everything God told I'm going to build where he told me to build. I'm going to build families. I'm going to build young people. I'm going to build those that need a miracle. Any builders in this house? Any builders in this house? Any builders in this house? Shake somebody. Tell them it's time to build. It's time to build. I'm done. Everybody give God praise. I'm finished. I'm finished, I'm finished, I'm finished.